Hello and welcome back to Manifolds. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And now in today's part 11, we will talk about the projector space again. However, in this video we will show that it is a well-defined manifold. For this, please recall, in the last video we have discussed the n-dimensional sphere, which is given as a set in Rn plus 1. So the typical example would be S2 in the three-dimensional space R3. However, also in the general case, we can show that Sn is an n-dimensional manifold. Indeed, in the last video, we have explicitly chosen an atlas with open sets U and charts H. Maybe I just tell you again how the open sets were defined. Here, Ui plus minus is simply given by all the points in Rn plus 1, where the ith component is positive or negative. So one possibility to write this down would be to say that plus minus xi is greater than zero. So you see, this is just a generalized hemisphere. Okay, so I have shown you this short recap, because when we want to talk about the projective space, we need to know the n-dimensional sphere. You might know this when you still have part 5 in mind. There, we have learned that the projective space P and R is given by a quotient space with the quotient topology. More precisely, the equivalence relation was defined on the n-dimensional sphere. Two points x and y are equivalent if they are at antipodes. In other words, this means that x is equal to minus y. Hence, this here is a well-defined equivalence relation and it gives us the projective space as a quotient space. Moreover, in this case you also know we have a canonical projection, which is also continuous. And usually we call this special map just Q. Here, please recall, it just maps the point X to its equivalence class. Okay, and now we are ready to define an atlas for PNR. As before for the sphere, we need to cover the whole topological space with open sets. Therefore, I want to define the set Vi. And this is given as the set of all points in P and R, so all equivalence classes, with the property that Xi is not zero. Please note, by the definition of the equivalence class, this set is well defined. Please recall, an equivalence class just consists of two points. Okay, now when we have the set vi, we can immediately look at the pre-image. Namely the pre-image under the map q. Of course, this is not so complicated. It simply gives us all the points in Sn where the ith component is not zero. Hence, it's simply the union of ui with the plus sign and ui with the minus sign. For example, here we could have the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. However, the first thing you should see is that this union of two open sets tells us that Vi is also an open set. We have this by the definition of the quotient topology. Moreover, we also see when i goes from 1 to n plus 1, then the whole space P and R is covered. Maybe we should visualize this in the case n is equal to 1. Then we can interpret the space P and R as the collection of all lines through the origin in the plane. In this case, V1 consists of all the lines with the exception of the line that goes through these two points. In addition, you see here on S1, the right-hand side would be U1 plus and the left-hand side U1 minus. Okay, so this is the first step. You see in the case n is equal to 1, we can cover P1R with V1 and V2. Of course, you should see for V2, the horizontal line is excluded. However, you know it's not enough to cover the whole space. We also need the charts H. So in our example here, we would need two charts H1 and H2. Therefore, I would suggest that we first look how we can define the charts in this case. More precisely, let's first define H1. Of course, this one has domain V1 and codomain V1 prime. 
Indeed, V1 prime should be an open subset in R1. Then this would show that the space P1R is a one-dimensional manifold. Okay, then the question for us here is, how can we define H1 such that we get a continuous map? And maybe you already have a good idea when you look at the lines in the plane here. Obviously, you know they have a well-defined slope. And moreover, a given slope uniquely determines a line. Hence, working with the slope seems to be a very good idea. So we only need to know how to calculate this slope when we have a point on the sphere. And when I say sphere, I mean the unit circle in the plane. So we have an x2 coordinate and an x1 coordinate. Therefore, the quotient should give us the slope. In other words, the change in the y direction x2 divided by the change in the x direction x1. An important thing to note here is, this map is well defined because a sign change would cancel out. So indeed, what we get here is a well-defined continuous map. Moreover, as we have suggested before, the map should also be bijective. It makes sense, but it means that we are able to write down the inverse map. And if we can show that this inverse is also continuous, we have our homeomorphism. In order to do this, we need to choose a name for the variable in V1 prime. Of course, we could call it x prime, but please note, this is a vector with one component. Therefore, because we want to generalize this later, let's already introduce an index here. In other words, this x1 prime is a real number we can interpret as a slope for a line in the plane. So the question is, how do we get the two points on the circle here when we only have the slope? Hence what we want is a point in the plane with two coordinates. And now by the definition of v1, we already know that x1 can't be 0. Therefore, we could choose the first component to be 1 and the second component to be x1 prime. Now if we see this as a vector in the plane, we would definitely get back the line. The slope would be x1 prime divided by 1. So you see, this is definitely the correct idea, but we don't get in general a point on the circle. It only fits if the slope is exactly 0. For all other cases, we need to scale this vector. In other words, we need to push the length of this vector, the Euclidean length, to 1. Hence, we just divide by the Euclidean length. So the square root of 1 squared plus x1 prime squared. In fact, this brings us to a point on the circle. However, we don't want a point on the circle, we want a point in the projective space. Therefore, we need to look at the equivalence class of this point. And with this, you see, we have defined the inverse of the map h1. And indeed, it's not hard to see that this is a continuous map. Hence, we have a homeomorphism between V1 and R1. In fact, you see, V1 tilde is exactly R1. Okay, and now in a similar way, we are able to define H2. Indeed, we just have to exchange the roles of X2 and X1. And then we see, we also get a homeomorphism. In other words, this then shows that the projective space P1R is locally Euclidean. And in combination that we already know that the projective space is a Hausdorff space and also second countable, we have a one-dimensional manifold. So you see, this is our first abstract example of a manifold. Okay, and in the end, this was not so hard to show. Of course, now you could ask, how do we do this for the general case, so for P and R? And indeed, it turns out the idea is completely the same, we just have to add more components. Therefore, it might be sufficient that I tell you how HI is defined. Still, we know the domain of HI, it should be VI again. However, now the codomain VI prime should lie in RN. Indeed, as before, we will see this is exactly Rn. 
More precisely, this means that hi sends an equivalence class to a vector with n components. However, the idea is exactly the same. We divide by the ith component. So first we have x1 divided by xi, then x2 divided by xi, and so on, until we reach x1 minus 1 divided by xi. And there we skip one component, so the next one should be xi plus 1 divided by xi. And then we just continue to the last position, which should be xn plus 1 divided by xi. Here, please don't forget, the vector x has n plus 1 components. However, now with this construction, the resulting vector is 1 in Rn. Okay, and now we should see, this works for each i from 1 to n plus 1. And moreover, similarly to before, we can show that this is a homeomorphism. Of course, the inverse looks more complicated than before, but the idea is the same. We just put 1 to the ith position and then we scale it back to the sphere. And then, of course, our conclusion is that we have an n-dimensional manifold. So this is what you can remember, the projective space is an example of an abstract manifold. Okay, I think that's good enough for examples now. In the next video we will see how we can add properties like differentiability to abstract manifolds. Therefore, I hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.